Good morning. Uh, thank you, Alana. Uh, good morning, sisters and brothers. And um, I want to talk about how the laws came to be the way they are and how we let it happen and what we've got to do to turn it around. Um, the first chink in the uh, rent regulation system, in the armor, if you will, was really not done in Albany. It was done at the New York City Council. And it was done in the spring of 1994 when the city rent laws, rent control and rent stabilization, were up for renewal again. Now, they come up for renewal every three years. This gets confusing because there's state laws that are separate laws that also come up for renewal in the state legislature. Uh, the city council just last week passed uh, bills to renew both rent control and rent stabilization for three more years. And there, on Monday at 4 o'clock, there's going to be a bill signing hearing when the mayor is going to have to listen to us um, talk about how he's really not doing a very good job of preserving affordable housing. Um, when, they, when these laws came up for renewal in the city council in March of 1994, um, Peter Vallone, who was the speaker of the city council, was planning to run for mayor. Actually, his plans to run got postponed a few years, but he was looking to raise money from real estate in order to run for mayor, which he finally did in 2001. Um, he had a chief of staff, a man named Joe, Ro Joe Strasberg, who left in January of, of 1994 to become the president of an organization called the Rent Stabilization Association, which despite its name is a landlord organization. Um, so Peter Vallone decided he was going to push through amendments to the rent laws to allow vacancy to control uh, on an ongoing basis and to allow what's called high income decontrol, which is often incorrectly and inaccurately referred to as luxury decontrol. There's no such language in the law. Um, so Peter Vallone set out to do this as a goodbye present to Joe Strasberg, who later helped raise money for his campaign for mayor. Um, the tenant movement was basically asleep at the wheel at that point, and when we sounded the alarm, it was already late in the, in the process. Uh, we did not know until late January that Malone was planning to do this. The laws were up for renewal in March. And um, some of us tried to get the tenant movement and tenant organizations to respond to this in an adequate way. We could have stopped this bill from passing. It only passed by two votes more than were needed. Um, and in fact, Malone did not have the votes to pass it at the regular stated meeting on a Wednesday, so they called an, an extraordinary meeting of the City Council on a Monday. The City Council never meets on Monday. When it passed 28 to 18, and that's only two votes more than are needed to pass anything in the Council. And several Council members who had promised their constituents in the weeks before that they would not vote for this ended up voting for it, several of them. Um, and what, why did they do this? Because we let them do it. Um, we, the tenant movement, uh, mounted a very, very feeble response to this. The, the lobbying effort uh, to stop this bill was basically uh, very weak. Um, I could tell you some stories about that, but I, I would bore you with the detail. Then three years later in 1997, when the state laws came up for renewal in Albany, and you might remember this was the year that Joe Bruno said he was not going to allow, he would not renew the laws uh, unless the uh, assembly agreed to phase them out over a two-year period. Joe Bruno was, of course, the Senate Majority Leader, uh, Republican from upstate New York, who has no rent regulation in his district, and who collected a huge amount of money from real estate uh, every two years. Um, we ended up that year with not only vacancy decontrol and high income decontrol incorporated into the state laws, and, and basically enshrined in the city laws because the state always has power over this that the city does not. So once it got into the state law, um, the, the city was then powerless. The city council having enacted vacancy control was powerless to repeal it. So the, um, and it wasn't just vacancy control that we got stuck with, it was a huge amount of weakening amendments um, that um, have 
really destroyed effective rent regulation in the city of New York and in the suburban counties around the city of New York. The most damaging of these amendments by far was vacancy to control. We calculate we've lost something like 200 to 300,000 apartments in the last 15 years to this mechanism. And many of those apartments were not legally deregulated, meaning the landlord did not get the rent up to $2,000. They just treat the opportunity of when an apartment becomes vacant, uh, it turns over and the landlord says, this is no longer a rent-stabilized apartment, stops registering the apartment with uh, the State Division of Housing, DHCR, which they're required to do every year for rent stabilized apartments. And if the tenant doesn't file a complaint in four years, nothing happens. The landlord gets away with it. And nobody knows exactly how many of these apartments have been done this way because it's illegal and there's no tracking of it. There's no enforcement by the state. So um, that's how we got to where we are. And um, what are we going to do to turn this around? Well, tenants pack. Uh, and many people in this room helped us. We worked over the last four election cycles to help the Democrats take control of the state Senate. And the reason we did that <clears throat> is because, you know, it's not that the Democrats are so great, it's that the Republicans are so bad. <laughs> and, um, plus, there are Democrats and there are Democrats, as you will see in a moment. But um, we, we knew that as long as the Republicans were in control of the state Senate, we would never be able to get any bill out of committee. Even the mildest little Mickey Mouse improvement in landlord-tenant relations for tenants, they would not allow any of that to go through. And the reason was that the way Joe Bruno kept his shrinking majority was through two mechanisms. One was drawing the district lines in a way that favors Republicans. Uh, and that's why the election next year is so important, because there will be redistricting following year, <clears throat> and real estate money. So um, over the last four election cycles, we worked very hard to get the Democrats in control. Just to give you an idea, before the November 2004 election, there were 38 Republicans in the state Senate and 24 uh, Democrats. Now there are 32 Democrats and 30 Republicans. And Tenants Pack and Tenants had a hand in all of those victories for the Democrats. And you know, a couple of the Democrats we helped elect, and one of whom I'm going to talk about, are not so great. Two of them, actually, I'm going to talk about. <laughs> not so great, and we knew that we were electing a conservative Democrat, but if it had been a Democratic fire hydrant, we would have been supporting the Democrat. <laughs> because unless the Democrats got the majority, there was no possible way of getting any improvements in the rent laws and reversing the phase out of the rent regulation system. So um, that's where we are now. We have the narrowest of majorities, 32, in the state Senate. And um, if you think that Albany has been polarized in the, in the past, the polarization and the partisanship uh, is even worse now. Because the Republicans, having lost narrowly, um, in last November's election, think they have a shot at recapturing the Senate majority next time, which is a year and a half away. Remember, for state Senate and state assembly, they run every two years, which means they're always running. Uh, and it is entirely within the realm of the possible that the Republicans will take the majority back by a narrow margin next time, in which case they will be, they will be in control of redrawing the district lines for the state legislature and Congress uh, for the next 10 years. That happens every 10 years. And the next time it happens will be 2012. And the 2012 election will be run in new district lines, which will not be so favorable to the Republicans if the Democrats maintain their majority. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> what's happening right now is that you've got 32 Democrats um, a good solid 20 or so of whom are solidly and strongly on our side. And we are encouraging them to work together to form a caucus, to become a group force within their own conference. We also have some creeps who are Democrats who are working <laughs> against us, actively working against us. And I'm going to talk about a couple of them, and I'm going to talk about one in particular that I'm hoping you will help us with. Um, we, um, we have a bill, the most important of these bills that you've seen described here on this red sheet, 
um, the most important of these by far, and the most difficult politically, is the bill to repeal vacancy decontrol. Frankly, I think there's a lot of these things the real estate lobby would be happy to swallow if they could avoid having vacancy decontrol repeal. And that's the biggie, because what that means is that they can continue, if, if they keep vacancy decontrol on the books, they can continue to phase out the rent regulation system whenever apartments turn over. And just to give you an idea about turnover, 10 to 11 percent of apartments in New York City turn over every year. Now that's not, it's sometimes the same apartment because sometimes people move out of a really bad apartment in, in order to get something better, but that's a pretty significant turnover rate. Don't believe the, the myth that no one ever, ever moves out of a rent regulated apartment. It's not true. People move for a variety of reasons, death, divorce, whatever. So that's by far the most difficult of all of these bills. And let me just tell you what's happening on that. We have, the bill has passed the assembly, as have these other bills. Um, we have 24 sponsors in the state senate, including one Republican, Frank Padavan of Queens, who we think we can count on. Um, and we need 32 votes. We calculate, by the way, that we have 28 solid votes, including four members of four Democrats who are not sponsors of the bill. But then how do we get from 28 to 32? And the Republicans, in general, are denying the Democrats any votes on just about any issue. They're basically saying, we're going to vote as a block against whatever you do. So if you've been following the news in the last few weeks, this whole issue of the MTA bailout, you know, the Republicans, even Republicans from upstate who have manufacturing businesses in their districts who manufacture subway cars and other things for the MTA, they're not going to vote to rescue the MTA. They're going to let the Democrats fl flounder and uh, take the heat for this. Um, so that's the problem we've got. Now, who, who are we, um, who are we um, looking at? We're looking at a few um, senators from Brooklyn, two Democrats and one Republican. The Republican is Marty Golden. Some of us just picketed his office last Friday out in Bay Ridge. It was a lot of fun, actually. Um, and we're putting a lot of pressure on him. We're, we're phone banking into his district. Uh, there's door knocking going on in his district. Uh, he has 30,000 almost rent regulated apartments in his district. That's one third of the voting public in his district. Hard for him to ignore. But Marty Golden could tell us, yeah, I'm going to vote for the bill. He could even put his name on the bill as a sponsor. And then when the bill comes up on the floor of the Senate, he takes a walk, meaning he leaves the chamber in order to avoid being reported as a vote. And that's the same as a no vote, as far as we're concerned, because we've got to have 32 votes. You can't pass anything in the Senate without 32 votes. Then there are two Democrats, Carl Kruger, uh, from Sheepshead Bay, Mill Basin, one of the most conservative uh, Democrats in the state of New York, uh, who has even more apartments under rent regulation than, than Marty Golden. And that brings me to a nearby Senator, Martin Malave Delon, who, after promising two different groups of constituents that he would put his name on the bill as a co-sponsor, has refused to put his name on the bill to repeal vacancy decontrol. Um, and this is a man who was in the city council in 1994 and who was a member of the city council housing committee. And I was present when he told two different groups of constituents, um, mostly from St. Nicholas Neighborhood Preservation Corporation. And this is the, the exact quote. I remember the words very vividly. I will never vote for any decontrol bill of any kind. You have my word. I heard him say that twice in a two week period. And then he ended up the following week voting for it. And now he's in the state senate, and he's not helping us. You have a little corner in this district, I believe. Yes, yes. Now, this may all sound very political, and you know what? It is political. <laughs> and there is no getting away from the fact that this is politics. And if we don't, if we don't respond and if we don't fight, we're going to lose. And we could be headed for a de defeat in Albany on this issue, which will have a devastating impact. And it's all going to happen in the next couple of months. So we really need you sitting here in this room to 
resolve when you leave here today that I'm gonna work on this, I'm gonna help. And we'll get into some of that. Delon and others are taking the position, they're, 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 here's the line they're putting out. Well, this vacancy decontrol bill really only affects Manhattan. Or another variation, it only affects rich white tenants in Manhattan. Because we don't have apartments renting in our district for $2,000 a month. That's what they said 13 years ago. I can't tell you how many of them said when we were lobbying the city council not to pass this bill to allow vacancy decontrol. I don't have any apartments in my district running for $2,000 a month. And we said, just wait 10 years and you will. Now, who was right? Were they right or were we right? OK? And that's what DeLon is putting out. That's the line he's giving people. This is a Manhattan-only bill. Doesn't affect Brooklyn. Doesn't affect my district. We need to beat the crap out of this guy. All right? And we need your help to do this. Uh, we have a phone list of registered voters who live in rent-stabilized apartments in Marty DeLon's district. And if PAC wanted to organize a phone bank locally, we'll give you the list. But Marty DeLon needs a lot of pressure because uh, we need his vote. We're going to have to get 32 votes. We have one Republican we think we can count on, and uh, the other Republicans we aren't so sure about. And it doesn't matter where the votes come from as long as we get 32 votes. We've got to make Marty DeLon change his position and see the light. The only way he's going to do that is if he gets brave. Okay, I'm going to finish there, and uh, I'm sure we'll loop back to some of this later.